Welcome to another video. Have you ever wondered whether you could, instead of integrating a certain function you're given, integrate the inverse of the same function and just switch the input and the output so that whatever error you get, you might as well assume is the same as the error of the original function since the inverses are just reflections of each other across the line y equals x. The answer is you could do that in certain cases, but generally it may not work. It depends on whether you could find the inverse of the function over that interval and whether differentiability and continuity applies to both of them at the same point. Well, there's so many things to consider, but there's something very close to that idea. It is called the idea of the area under the inverse of the function. So what I'm going to do in this video is introduce this concept to you if you don't know it already because it's a useful tool. I'm going to solve a, a question in the next video which is going to require this concept. So let's get into it. Let y be equal to the function f of x. Okay? This function f of x is continuous and differentiable over a closed interval. It has to be a closed interval because we don't want crazy stuff happening at the boundaries. Okay? Let y equals f of x. Notice that if you have another function that is the inverse of f, okay? If g is the inverse of f, which means f is invertible, okay? It's very important because we're talking about the inverse of the function. If g is equal to the inverse of f, then g of the output, y, must be equal to x. Okay, remember when you put the output in this function, you're going to get your original input back. That's the meaning of inverse functions. Okay, so let's go back here. If we differentiate both sides here, if we differentiate, we have y prime, or let's call it dy, will be equal to f prime of x dx. Okay, if we differentiate this, we're going to get dy dx equals f prime of x. We can move the dx here, and then you have dy equals f prime of x dx. We're trying to build something. Now see what happens. If y equals f of x is continuous on this closed interval, it means that when x is a, y will be f of a. So, just pay attention. When x equals a, y equals f of a. And when x equals b, y equals f of b. Okay, it is important that we're able to see this. Let's say we want to integrate the inverse of the function, which is g of y. Okay, that is the inverse. Okay, we have the integral of g of y with respect to y. We want to see what it is. Now, remember, this is continuous over a, b. The inverse must also be continuous over f of a, f of b, because these are the inputs for y. Okay, these are the inputs for, for, the, for this function, for the inverse function. Okay, so it means the boundary for integration here is going to be f of a, f of b. We're just, we're just integrating over this boundary. See what happens. What did we say g of y was? Ta -ta -da -da. G of y is x. It's as if we're integrating x. What is this is going to be? dy. What's dy? I think we did dy. Oh, it's f prime of x dx. f prime of x dx. Now, the interval for this one is going to be from a to b, because that's what you can feed into anything x, a to b. And that's it. 
So this is the only tricky part. If you can establish this relationship, then we can just, we really don't know this function, but we know how to integrate this. If we integrate this function, we can do integration by parts. Integration by parts. We say um, u will be equal to x, so that du will be equal to 1 dx, because this is easy to integrate. If you integrate this, you're going to get v equals f of x. That's it. We're done. So by IVP, we know that uv, so this integral here, dy, is going to be uv, u times v, is going to be x times f of x. Oh, yeah, that's it. f times f of x minus v du, it's going to be v times du, that's just f of x times, huh, uv minus the integral of v du, which is going to be just f of x. Okay, so this has to be evaluated from a to b. This has to be integrated from a to b dx. Oh, du is going to be dx, not 1. It's supposed to be 1 dx. I knew my dx was missing. Okay, so it's going to be f of x dx, and that's what you have. But look, we've gone back to what we could have had originally. See what happens. If I bring this guy back here, I'm going to have the integral from a to b of f of x dx. If I add it to this, it's going to be plus the integral of f of a, f of b, of g of y, dy will be equal to, if I plug in these values here, b for x is going to be b times f of b minus a times f of a. This is almost what we need, except that it doesn't matter what variable I'm integrating by, I can easily switch this to g of x dx. It doesn't matter. It's just that the value I'm plugging has to be just bx. So I can make it g of x dx. It does not matter the letter you're using for integration. But these are the numbers that we need. As long as you can show that this is the inverse of this, this relationship will be true. As long as differentiability and continuity for that closed interval can be established, yeah. Now, there's some times where it would not work, but those are special cases, okay? Or, if you add both of them together, you're going to get two times one of these. Then you know this is just doubling. You're folding it over the other one. Okay. Now, this may not look as clear until I give you an example. So let's take a very basic example, and let me show you the geometric representation of what I just did. Let's focus on this side just for now. Okay, if I have this integral, this is the graph of x squared, and I'm trying to integrate from 1 to 2. Well, that's going to be the area under the x squared graph, right, from 1 to 2. So I can say that the region under the graph or under the curve is going to be something like this, okay? My lines are not straight, just forgive me, okay? So this is what I'm talking about. This is the area under the x squared graph from one to two. That's the area under the curve. Now, if I were to find the inverse of x squared, the inverse of x squared is the square root of x, and I want to integrate from, well, 1 to 4. As you can see, the region that is covered by this is from here to here. It's from 1 to 4. And you notice, how do you get your 1? Just plug in 1 into the function. 1 squared is 1. 2 squared is 4. So now I'm covering that region. The area under this curve, if I invert it, it's going to be this area. Look, it's going to be here. 
I know that line is not perfectly straight, but we can, we'll take it like that. So this is the region that I'm talking about. Do you see it? So the sum that we're having, um, let's call this A, let's call this B. We're saying that A plus B is equal to this entire area, two times four, two times four minus, what part did we not rule on? It's just this tiny part. This is the region that is not ruled. This is the only part that is useless. This is a common part. This is exclusive. This is exclusive. This part is not included. And this is the part where we say it is A times F of A. What is A? A is one. What is F of A? F of A is also one, one times one. So this is the common region. This is exclusive to the um, inverse. This is exclusive to the original function. We still add all of them together, but the only part that we don't need is the part that is not involved in the integral. And that's what we have. So what do we have? This is gonna be eight minus one, which is equal to seven. So if you individually integrate this and integrate this and add them together, you'll find that your answer has got to be seven. There is a G advanced exam problem that I saw and I, my mind came to this. That's why I'm explaining this. I'm going to use it in the next video. Never stop learning. Those who stop learning, stop living. Bye-bye.